yeah, this is basically the race car. So 2022 Can-Am X3, um, done most of the build on the channel. So if you're not subscribed and you like this sort of thing, subscribe. But yeah, so I'm gonna do a front to back uh, walk around, wheel around in my case, um, of the chassis, what we've done to it, the outside of the car, electrical, um, the interior, and just everything we've done to it and kind of what I've learned and uh, hopefully some things to avoid and some recommendations I have to hopefully, you know, save you guys some money because uh, there's a lot of things you can buy on these and a lot of things you don't necessarily need. This is kind of the, the basic modifications you need to, to race and have it be race legal and reliable. So, but uh, yeah, and the, I'll, I'll include a build list at the end with, with all the all the retail prices and that sort of thing. Um, and I'll try to try to let you know what I've done that you don't necessarily need. But uh, anyway, yeah, subscribe and uh, follow along. All right, exterior hard parts we'll start with. So first off, I have the SDR Baja bumper. Um, basically, if you can see, there's so there's room for a, a uh, the fair lead with the winch in there. Um, it replaces the whole, this is, this is just the, the plastic, um, little piece right here, but basically it replaces the whole bulkhead. That's a better, better look at it. And that braces these front arms here. Um, and like that stock one added a little bit of double shear bracing to the, to the arm bolts. Um, but yeah, this one helps a bunch for that. So Definitely recommend, if you're doing a bumper, do one that replaces the whole bulkhead. But also up here, I have an aluminum uh, grill, both the upper, I, I forget which brand that is. Um, but yeah, and then the DRT bolt-on grill, which literally just bolts over the factory grill. Not super stoked on that one, but uh, it works and it looks okay. Fits weird, I don't know. We had to kind of like flex it in there and do some weird stuff there, but not a huge deal. And kind of two other chassis things I just thought of, <laughs> my number plates that I'm really stoked on, that's literally just carbon fiber sheet that I bought from Amazon and then got some dirt bike number plates made to those Axia alloy mounts. Um, but though, if you have a stock cage for an X3, you can just bolt them up right there. There's two holes right there that'll bolt right up and just order the, like I said, just carbon fiber aluminum sheeting and then some dirt bike uh, custom backgrounds that were like 60 bucks or something. I got the, basically the biggest dirt bike number plates I could find, which were, I told them that I had a 97 CR250, a Honda CR250. They have ginormous side plates. Um, so that's all those were from, and then I just cut them out. And as far as other hard parts, right now I'm doing the shock therapy tie rod BSD kit, putting that on right now. Um, this thing has hella bump steer, and, and those factory tie rods are paper thin, like up there and all that, so. That should help with bump steer and just bracing. And also, up here we got 15 inch KMC wheels, true bead locks on 33 inch Kenda um, Mastodons. These are really, really, really good tires. I bought them used from somebody. Um, they're a little worn out, but definitely, definitely, definitely recommend these tires. They're nice and skinny, which is actually what you want on an X3. You don't want big, wide flotation tires. These bite really, really hard and give you great traction, especially at speed. And then on the back, as far as hard parts, got just got these installed. Shock therapy radius rods. The steel ones, the 4130 chromoly steel with a geyser pull plate. They are beef cake. They're so much thicker than stock. Definitely, definitely, definitely recommend those because when you come down on the side, like a side impact hard on this, this like rear wheel that way, it'll bend one of these lower rods in like the, the, especially the lower one or the upper one. And it'll tilt the, the rear wheel in or out and you'll all of a sudden get your ass in kicked sideways if you're like in whoops or something. And it could either send you over or what happens a lot is bend a trailing arm, bend a shock or 
punch your axle through the transmission or through the diff. All three really, really expensive. So yeah, recommend bracing that up for sure. You don't have to do trailing arms, but uh, yeah, recommend those. And then other safety stuff, this is the um, Cageworks Shorty Prefab Cage. It's super, super beefy. And it's got really clean, clean welds, really nice aluminum roof. It's solid and it's about the cheapest one on the market, but definitely the beefiest one that I've seen in person. Really well made, fits very, very well. I did a did the installment of that on the channel so in a previous video, so check that out if you're curious. But uh, yeah, and it's powder coated, this chrome red. Basically they chrome powder coated it and then did a transparent red on top by Quality Powder Coating in Hayden, Idaho, which is who did the radius rods because they came black and then we powder coated them silver and then same coating on the the pull plate um and also on that note this is the extreme performance rear bumper basically bolts into the chassis right there doesn't stick out very far in the rear and then comes up it's hard to tell but bolts into the what is that the c-pillar pillar whatever those are called and what we also got up there came with the the mac um three-way tie down strap we got the spare up there and then there's the prp spare tire bag that fits inside of the rim so we have the um the impact in there and clutch tool and some other stuff and regarding the spare i got this jack off of rocky mountain atv i think it's tusk brand it's like 150 bucks Super nice. Um, I had to do a couple mods to it, like just put a, it's actually a scotch Bright pad on there just so it'll grip. Um, and then we had to make a little extension that we put on top of that so that way it'll get high enough. But, oh, and then we had to kind of weld on a plate on the bottom too, kind of do some mods to it just for this, this case. Also welded a socket on the end so we can use an impact that we, you know, run it up really quickly for when we inevitably have a flat tire. But yeah, that's like 165 bucks, I want to say. It's pretty cheap. No, not even that much. I don't know. 150? I can't remember. But yeah, really, really cheap and uh, works pretty well. Not, you know, quite as good as an $800, uh, oh God, what are those jacks? But anyway, yeah, works well. Recommend it. And kind of the last chassis mod I did, it's hard to see. I have a super ATV shock tower brace. Basically, there's not a lot that connects. I don't know if you can see this part of the chassis, that's the that's the front of the bulkhead goes up to, or the, not the bulkhead, I, I shouldn't say that, but that, that whole like horn of the chassis where the arms bolt to, it's not really supported to the shock tower so there's kind of like an area between there of no support. And that's one of the main things that flexes on an X3 and breaks. You can tell by um, the fan shroud. If the fan shroud ever breaks, that means your chassis bent and basically squished together like this from the, shop, from the top of the shock tower down to the chassis down there. So these braces are super common. Basically, that's, that's kind of the top of it. And this is one area I would not skimp on. Go with a good brand one, not Super ATV. As you can see there, the radiator hose is, it's supposed to be routed that way up behind it. That radiator hose is rubbing on it. And we had to put foam and heat tape and all that stuff on there. And it's super ghetto. There's not a way you can route that radiator hose through it and make it look better. Um, it's just a bad design. Go with CT Raceworks or literally any of the big brand of shock tower braces. It's really important to have a brace there, but yeah, go with a good quality one. And the final chassis mod that I'll go over, Vital Motion Co. fully revalved suspension with Hyperco springs, fully set up. It works amazingly. It helps so freaking much as you saw in the suspension video. All right, engine, drivetrain, etc. 
completely stock engine. This thing is super fast as is. I don't, the, I, in that last Montana race, I passed so many people that were broken down because they blew up or just had engine issues, wasn't running right. These things are so fast from the factory. They're, you're, lim you're more limited by your chassis than anything with racing, especially long distance stuff. But uh, as you can see, got a Treel Performance exhaust. They're out of Oregon, they're, or no, Vancouver, Washington. But very, very, very well-made stainless hand TIG welded exhaust. I have 600 miles on this thing and no issues, didn't have to tune it, anything like that. It's got two different bungs for the O2 sensors. Sounds really good. <laughs> But yeah, so they have a few models. Um, this is the sport system, I think. They also have the resonated sport system where on that section, there'd be a resonator chamber that quiets it down quite a bit. They also have the KOH system that's a side exit, and then they have the like the race. And yeah, there, there's a few other systems. The race system that's like straight exhaust and a few others, but... Yeah, definitely, definitely recommend Trio. They're awesome to work with and they have a bunch of performance parts. And air filter. Uh, the I have the Donaldson, whatever it is, on Amazon. It's a two-stage uh, paper filter. Looks really similar to the stock one, but there's like an inner filter. And super, super important in outerwear. Um, kind of like a pre-filter that goes on the outside of the filter we have in there. I race super dusty stuff and it's been great every time definitely recommend that. Ideally, you'd get a particle separator, but those are like $600 and this works pretty well. Um, you know, if you're racing hammers or Baja or something, obviously you need, you need more than just this, but for everything I've done, it's been great. And while I'm over here, stock clutching. If your motor's stock, you're not making more power, leave the clutching stock. Um, I mean, yeah, you can get a little bit of performance out of it, but honestly, I think it's pretty damn good stock, especially with these P drives. And then as far as belt, I run the world's best belt. Um, they're all pretty damn good. I haven't had any issues, knock on wood, yet with belts. Um, but yeah, I mean, this this one is a, it's a world's best belt and lasted me a while. I have that race on it and then a couple play rides on it. And that race, we were, we were getting pretty high belt temps. Um, and yeah, I've have had good luck. I'm going to throw a new one in for the next race, but, but yeah. And also on the drive note, something, a couple things that were really recommended by Chris Blaze, uh, factory Can-Am driver and off-road racing legend, um, stock axles. This is actually really important. I don't know about you guys, but I would rather break a $100 axle than blow a $1,500 diff. It's a big, big, big expense and all that, especially if you blow the rear diff or the transmission or something. And I'd rather be changing an axle. But the one thing I did do, as you can see, I wrapped it in, in masking tape. Kind of, I don't know, it's an old buggy trick. I don't know if it actually helps a bunch, but just protects it from those little nicks and things that'll turn into cracks over time and just weaken it over time. So I noticed the when I changed the radius rods, the lower ones were sandblasted to holy hell and have all these little nicks and pits on them and all that. And I don't know, I redid the, redid the tape recently and not a single nick or pit on those axles. So it did pretty well. And electrical system now. So as you can see, we have two rigid, uh, what are those, dually pod lights. They're okay. Um, I got two more up there that I usually have them sticking out to the side more. Like that one's kind of out to the side. They do decently um, along with the stock headlights. The Heretic ones are really, really nice, but they're like, what, $1,000 or something. Um, 
they work really well. Uh, if you have a base model X3, don't worry about doing these stupid little eyebrow light things. They don't produce anything. They're just for looks. I, I couldn't care less if I had them or not. The one I love, Baja Designs, uh, the Onyx 6 shock tower light with the, it's just bolted to the shock tower brace. Works super well. I have this yellow cover on it. Um, so it's a white light with the yellow cover. You can also just get yellow lenses where you pull all those little Allens out and you can replace that with a yellow or you can order them that way. But uh, yeah, fully rebuildable. Very, very, very well made. I've gone down the Amazon light bar route. Will not go back. It's well, well worth the money. But yeah, on the electrical note, you can see we have dual horns. Um, ideally, if you're racing, you need a siren because they're really loud. These are kind of hard to hear over engine noise and all that, especially when you're in another vehicle. But um, we have two because uh, my co-driver has control of one. I have control of the other. We just wanted to, I don't know, Pops, Pops got them for really cheap. Uh, they're, I think one's a Pia brand and I forget what the other is, but they're they're pretty loud. But yeah, I have control of one, the co-driver has control of the other. And also on the electrical note, we have GG lighting. Um, actually, it's a custom made chase bar. We have on the outside red, and that for the, the outside two lights are red, and then amber for the next two, and then the blue, or the, the middle is blue, which is mandated. Um, this one, it's not a blue strobe, it's a blue solid. So I ended up having to get the KC blue strobe, which is just literally just blue uh, flashing and it is bright. So that's kind of race specific stuff. So before you do chase bars and stuff, look at the um, requirements. A lot of them, like some require green, some require solid amber, some are flashing amber, blue, but also note that blue is illegal in a lot of um, public riding areas. So you gotta be careful of that. We have that blue in the middle switch separately so I can turn it off, but also run the red and amber chase light for when we're in public areas like dunes and all that. Um, and then that top one, <laughs> that's just a crappy battery powered Amazon one that's red and blue flashing, which uh, also probably illegal, but um, obviously we never run it. That's just an emergency one. If I break down, because I'm a paraplegic, I can't just jump out of the car easily. I can reach back and just push a button on that. It doesn't require vehicle power or anything like that. We just have that as a last minute or last resort emergency. So yeah, it's just kind of an idea. Pops wanted it just to be safe. And one of the last electrical things on the car, um, on the exterior that I'll mention is PCI pumper. Um, those help so much. Basically, if you don't know, pumps in fresh air or pumps in dirty air and then there's a filter under that bell and then it pumps air into the helmets both driver and co-driver that's what those two hoses are all right and interior stay with electronics for now um dome light just a cheesy one off amazon we got and then there's where that pumper runs through it's zip tied to this kemimoto uh center bag thing to be honest don't buy those um it snaps onto the turbo cover and if you know from an x3 those turbo covers they're designed to pop off really quickly um i don't know if it's a fire thing but it's a quick access for if there's an engine fire you can pop the cover off and stick a fire extinguisher right there but because basically the turbo is right there um yeah there's a little little cover and that bag just snaps onto it. And because of that, that bag makes the whole cover fall off all the time. So we had to modify it. Um, yeah, and if you put anything heavy, like an impact or tools in there, it'll pop off even quicker. So yeah, stay away from those. But yeah, continuing with electronics, we have Sasquatch lights, which are those pillar lights, um, bumper lights. Those are the, the two rigid dualies. Let's see, and then as far as other switches, co-driver's horn, and then those are the, the X3 controls that come with it. Um, and then down here, the pumper control, 
dome light, and then that's the the KC strobe light. And then that, just to the right of the steering, that blue one is the um, the main chase bar. And then this is for the blue light in the center. Like I said, it's, it's switched separately, so I can turn that off. And then as far as communication, <sighs> this one makes me shake my head. I went cheap. I went with Nav Atlas. I have the, uh, NC, the NNT-10 intercom system with the NCR2 radio. It works, but I don't know. I've had a lot of issues. It's not... I feel bad saying anything bad about it because they're great to work with. They're really nice people. Andrew, the tech support person, is awesome, but it's it's not a great radio. Um, s spend the extra money, get a PCI, get a rugged, just trust me it's not worth the little bit of money that you save it's maybe 200 bucks you save on a 1700 dollars system um like these are these are the connectors and to pull to disconnect it from your helmet you have to push this little button in so like a quick egress you have to be finding this little teeny tiny spring-loaded button otherwise you're stuck in here um like rugged and pci i think they both have bluetooth communication systems so you can get out and still have communication like they're, they're quick disconnect they're they're great yeah definitely stick with a good brand um but basically how that works and i'll get into the hand controls in a second i have the push to talk button here so i can push to call back to base um those two coil cables are they plug into my helmet and the co-driver's helmet so we're always talking basic controls on there and then my co-driver on the grab handle that's the other push to talk button so he can call back to to base or call out with that button it works it's not great but uh yeah and otherwise as far as communication goes and or i i guess i'll transition to navigation this is the Kemimoto tablet holder thing. Um, they're really cheesy. I had to, let's see. I had to do an L bracket on here just to hold this closed. It kept popping open. And so I riveted this little L bracket on there so I can close it. And then let's see if I can do this. And then put the pin through because this was popping open um, when I was driving. So basically, I, and then I put uh, Velcro on there just as a secondary thing for the iPad. Um, it works. However, it's really hard to see from the co-driver's seat because he's always looking at the center console. What I ended up getting was this RAM mount uh, tablet holder thing. Basically, that holds the tablet itself. Got it specifically for my iPad. And then there's like a, it's like a ball mount on there um, with an extension. And then I think that's a, it's a roll cage mount basically. Um, so I'm gonna hopefully put that in tonight, but basically it's gonna mount here and then it'll swing over and it'll put the iPad right about here. So that way it'll be right in front of his face, but then we can still have access to the glove box. And on the navigation note, what I have is right there. It's a dual brand XGPS 160, I think is the model. Um, actually, it's it's a GPS receiver for, for aircraft, um, but you basically have to have it for power sports stuff if you're going at speed at all. Even even with a cellular tablet tablet or cell phone or anything like that, the location isn't precise enough, especially with racing. You have to have to have to have one of those. Basically how it works is that's your GPS receiver. I hardwire it in. Um, there's a couple wires I have that just plug into the cigarette lighter under there um, that then I feed through and it plugs right into the side of it so it's always wired. Um, and then you just Bluetooth connect that to your iPad, um, like we run lead nav, 
but it's a great receiver and it's like 160 bucks, I think. But um, yeah, so if you're running lead nav, which is the best um, budget GPS system, like I've run it on literally an iPad Air 2 or Air 1 even, it was like a hundred dollar iPad I got on eBay and it works really, really well. Um, so I have like total, I think a $350 navigation system. Whereas most desert racers are two, $3,000. Um, is it the best option? No, but it works great. And I definitely recommend that if you're on a budget. And on the electrical system note, what we have is full throttle battery big battery um i think it's an a yeah it's an agm battery works really really well and then this um distribution block individually labeled pops did a ton with that um basically there's a bus what is it a bus bar or a bus post or something like that or the accessory post like down under here but if you're doing a bunch of accessories like we have you need one of these, the distribution block. Um, I don't want to pull it off there, but there's a bunch of fuses in there. It works super, super, super well. Um, I'll list in the in the description which one it is specifically, but it's a power sport specific one, um, and they work great for all these accessories. Ideally, you do a switch pros, um, and then you don't have to have all these freaking switches all over the dash. But those are like 700 bucks and this option if you're okay with doing some wiring and you're handy with that sort of thing is like i don't know 150 bucks with all the wiring and everything so this works great it's a great great cheap option and last little budget um electronics thing <laughs> axia alloys um dome light it's self-powered you just plug it in with a usb cord and works really well actually it's pretty bright and with these cube lights i should mention those are axia alloy just the the a pillar light mounts um i think they're like 45 dollars or something they work really well they're machined aluminum you can get them in in either just anodized raw aluminum or black anodized you can get them of all sizes that's actually the mount i have for basically every accessory on here is it axia alloys that's what brand of mirror I have and all that. You just want to make sure and get the mount for your tubing size. Like they have stock um, one, 1.85 inch. I think it's a stock X3 diameter. This is 1.75 inch. Um, but yeah, they have everything up to even the, what is that? Two five inch, I think is the main chassis tube um, on the back here. And safety stuff. So these are, well, I guess I should start with the harnesses. They're pro armor. I have a three inch harness on this side, five point. Um, they're okay. I have two and a half inch on that side. I wish I would have gone with that. Three inch is really big, especially if you're using a Hans device um, or any kind of frontal neck restraint, you really are supposed to have 2.5 inch at, at the widest. Three inches a little bit too wide in my opinion. And I, I say that as a bigger dude. And really highly recommend five point, not four point. This submarine belt helps a ton. Um, basically this holds the buckle from riding up higher onto your stomach and just makes it a lot more comfortable. Basically everyone has harnesses in their rigs, but a lot of people don't know how you're supposed to actually set them up. Um, get in, you tighten the lap belt first, the submarine belt, you don't adjust every time you get in. That should be basically the same, same, um, length, but you tighten the lap belt first after, after it's all clicked into place, obviously, then you tighten the shoulders last. Cause you want, you want the buckle. Basically you want this as low on your lap as possible, but really tight. So you're being held into the seat this way, then you tighten the shoulders last because you don't want the shoulders tight before the lap is tight because that'll compress your spine in a big in a big wreck, which I don't know a lot about off-road stuff. I don't pretend to be a professional, but I do know a lot about spinal injuries as someone who has broken my back. Um, you don't want to do that. 
But yeah, definitely recommend that because what can happen is in a big wreck, if you don't have that submarine strap, the buckle will slide up your stomach and you'll end up slouching down into the seat and kind of sliding this way. And then it'll compress your lower back instead of your hips, like you're, you're sitting this way instead of your, your hips kind of bending like that. It'll bend your lower back if you don't have that submarine strap. So it takes five extra seconds to strap in, maybe. But definitely, it makes it just more comfortable because it keeps the straps where they're supposed to be. And I really like it. I don't like getting in cars with four-point harnesses or worse. And then what I did with the, which I'll, I'll talk about the seats in a second, but I have them um, on the lower position and then I cut this down. That's, you had to do that with these seats, but... Yeah, basically um, put them in the lower position and then I put some, sh or I changed the shimming on the back to drop them down as low as possible, especially the uh, the co-driver side because my co-driver's <laughs> freaking 6'2 and huge. But one big thing I would recommend, I put, I did, which I did a, its own video on this, but basically got new hardware, a uh, really high-end bolt that, go, that goes through the, the belt and then I put a shim in there. It's a stainless steel washer. It's like half an inch thick. Basically raises the belt angle um, instead of it being like this going through the seat. And then it, like if you're taller, it'll go up over your shoulders, which compresses your back. If it's a higher, it, or instead of a belt angle like this, it'll be more level and it'll pull you into the seat in a big crash instead of downward. You don't want pressure on your shoulders downward ever, basically. You want to be sucked into the seat. So that just made it a lot more comfortable for me um, and just helps a lot. And it's a really cheap fix and I really, really enjoy it. Um, but yeah, onto the seat note. These are, these are Ace's brand um, Apex seats. Uh, I'm not a big fan of them, to be honest. They're cheap. They're like half the price of PRP. Actually, I think even less than that. I think these were, I don't know, $500 for the set or something like that. Uh, they're okay. They're fine for like a Duner casual driver. Um, they're really heavy. They use the stock mounts, as you can see, which I'm not a fan of. These, these adjusters factory are trash. So... Yeah, not, not a fan of that at all. Um, I'm honestly going to switch to PRP GT3s, I believe. Um, they're also really... They hold you in well, but they're really hard to get out of. They have this really high side bolstering, but it's kind of in a weird way where you're, like, sitting down in a pocket. And, yeah, they're, they're just... I don't know. They're not that comfortable, to be honest. They are suspension seats, yeah, I don't know. They're better than stock. I will say that. Definitely. And they're great for the money, but I don't know. I think with safety stuff like this, spend the extra money, get PRP, get Simpson, Sparco, Corbo, any of those that are that are really well made. Um, as far as suspension versus hardback seats, personally, I like suspension seats. They're a lot more comfortable, but there's downsides. In a big crash, they can compress and kind of loosen up your belts and I don't know they're not not the greatest that way but also they save you for those little bumps but yeah and a little safety trick we figured out to get around the rules um or to to address some of the rules a lot of times if you're using swinging doors they man the the rule makers mandate a um secondary latch system so this is the factory one it's pretty cheesy um this is an aftermarket uh handle on it normally it's just a pull rope thing they're too easy to open honestly which is kind of nice but one of the things to get around that basically these are these are like amazon lower doors they're really cheap um but they have this steel steel frame around it and we got these axia uh i think they're light mounts for a cage and basically drill the hole through that and when you close the door you can put this pin through right there i put it on a cable and then it'll go through that so it'll hold the door shut so in the event of an emergency you just pull this and then you're free to go 
um, works really well and definitely, definitely recommend that. A lot of people will use like bungee cords or whatever else to get around that rule. And then I also on the door have a fire extinguisher in here. It's just quick, just to unzip. It's right there. Um, I have an ABC powder one. A lot of people recommend Halon or CO2, but some series require ABC because I think they're they're the best at fighting the biggest range of fires, I think. I'm not an expert on fire extinguishers, obviously, but it's a dry powder, and I know these can get compacted in there, and then you like lose um, like lose the amount of retardant in there. So a lot of times what you need to do with these type of fire extinguishers is like after a bigger hide or something, turn them upside down and just leave them like that. So if you ever see firefighters um, or just people using these kind of fire extinguishers, a lot of times they'll turn them upside down when they're when they're fighting a fire because you'll get a lot more out of it. Especially when in an off-road vehicle where you're hitting big bumps and slamming and it'll compact in there. So, And then you may have seen, I have the other fire extinguisher on here with a quick release. Basically you pull that red handle and it's ready to ready to go. Um, I think it's an Axia, let's see, I, I believe it's an Axia mount. I don't know, it was like a year ago when I bought that, but works really well. I mean, it's been on there for a long time and nothing hasn't fallen off yet. And then I'm not gonna pull it out, but in the glove box, I do have a first aid kit. I think that's really important to keep in there. Just just some basic stuff, basic bandages, a tourniquet, um, some basic pain meds and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I think that's important to keep in there, uh, like an ace bandage, um, yeah. And then uh, kind of exterior safety feature. I have PRP nets. Every racing series there is requires window nets. Um, even if you're just a play driver, I recommend window nets. Work really, really well. Um, <laughs> these are designed for a factory cage. So there's a big ugly gap there. Um, Hostile is the main company, but PRP also does this, where you can make your own frame out of half-inch, like, chromoly tubing. You just make it basically into the window opening shape, and then you can get off of uh, CarTech a hinge kit, and then you can get, like, gas shocks so they'll, like, flip open, basically. It'll stay rigid. With these, basically with these, they're magnetic. You just grab the little red tab, pull that, pull that and they come undone. It's super quick and easy. Work really well. I, I like them a lot. I would not even play drive without window nets anymore. They don't hinder your vision, especially once you get used to them. They work very, very well. Then a uh, couple little things. So Seismic makes really, really, really well-made mirrors. They're an aluminum casing. Um, they have a lifetime warranty actually. So you can get, get the glass replaced. Um, they're, they swing in, and then all you do is, you can see there's like little teeth in there, flip it out, and they lock into position. So if you hit something, they're, they're just going to fold in, and then you just push it right back out, and it'll go right back into the right place. They're, they're pretty cheap. I want to say they're like 150 bucks or something. Work really, really well. They have a, uh, you can replace that little red thing you know, just with whatever color you want. They have like blue, green, yellow, black etc. Okay, and safety stuff continued. Definitely recommend a good quality helmet. I I used to use just a moto helmet and that's about it and and then just moto goggles. I switched recently to a um an automotive style helmet with an actual Hans device. Personally, I use a next gen uh Rev 2. Yeah. Rev2 um, Hans type device where shoulder straps go over and it hooks to the helmet so it basically holds you in the car you still have very good side to side movement and you can see out the out the the sides of the car out the windows um, but it keeps you from hard impact keep from whiplash I have a spinal injury I don't want to mess with that stuff I don't recommend anybody else doing that neck donuts they they don't work. They're not, they're not legal in basically any racing series for a reason. Even for play driving, I would recommend a Hans device. And for driving, I use, um, well, I'm head to toe pyrotect, both my co-driver and I, they, 
they make really, really, really high quality stuff for a very fair price. Fire suit, shoes, gloves. They do custom gloves, custom fire suit, really well-made helmets for really, really cheap. That's actually why I started using them. Um, and I paid full retail for everything. And then it's like, hey guys, how about uh, helping me out? So they started kind of giving, giving me a little bit of love on there. But um, yeah, so, and they're a really cool company to deal with out of the Northwest and it's all American made stuff, I think. Um, but yeah, so Pyrotech is awesome. But yeah, so that's kind of the gist of this thing. It's pretty straightforward. A lot of just little bolt-on things. Um, like I said, with safety stuff, communications, etc., I would recommend spending the extra money on the brand name of the seats and the radio system and all that. But um, yeah, as far as the other stuff, a lot of times it's cheaper. The door bags, which I didn't mention, they're Kemimoto. They're like the same as PRP, but they're like a quarter of the price. Stick with those, that kind of stuff. Um, by all means, save the money if if you can. Um, those seismic mirrors are great. Do they have fancy lights in them like the uh, the Sector 9s? No, but they're an eighth of the price, I think. The lights spend extra money on, but a $75 Amazon light bar is better than no light bar. So if that's all you can afford, do it. Get a good cage. That's a big takeaway I would have. I would say from this, especially with having in one of my last videos where I rolled the the waxy, um, the cage did not bend. We thought it did initially, but uh, yeah, had that been a stock cage, we would have really, really been messed up. And do do a good cage, good harnesses, good seats, that sort of thing. Keep yourself safe. Um, but yeah, and. I think that what I'll end on is what I want to do next to this thing um, that's not mentioned in here. Like I said, doing tie rods right now, tonight hopefully. Um, I'm going to do lower um, lower A-arms on the front. I'm going to do a front sway bar because these things body roll like you would not believe coming into a hard corner like under hard braking and cornering, they'll just squat in the front right or front left. And it doesn't feel like it's close to rolling, but also doesn't feel stable. So front sway bar, is it helps a lot. Um, I might do a front drive shaft, a heavy one, like a, what is it, Sandcraft, I think makes a really good one. Um, and other than that, it's pretty set. I don't want to tune it. Um, these you have to send the ECU off to Evo and I think they're pretty expensive to, to get that done. But, um, otherwise, I don't know. I'm going to wrap it. I think this winter, I'm going to have my buddy at Envision Designs, um, here in Idaho. He does all my sticker stuff. He's, he's awesome. Um, that's about it. These things stock are really, really good, but they need some help. Um, like I said, don't skimp on the safety stuff. You need to upgrade the safety stuff. These stock cages are a joke. Do some bracing here and there. But as far as the engine stuff, these things are really fast stock. Um, suspension is a big one, like I said. But otherwise, I mean, this is a pretty solid car and there's not much I wanna change on it now that I got a lot of the bracing done. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, pretty much what you need to go desert racing. Could there be more? Of course. Could I have a better navigation system? Yeah. Could I have a custom dash with a lot more space for switches and things like that? Of course. Um, could this thing make more horsepower? Sure. But I mean, honestly, this thing's really, really good as it is and pretty damn solid. So anyway, Enough rambling. Um, thanks for watching. I'm trying to do more of these kind of uh, advice videos, um, trying to steer people away from things that I've wasted money on or learned the lessons I've learned the hard way and things like that, trying to just spread um, the knowledge that I'm learning over the course of this. Um, yeah, so 
follow along, subscribe if you're not, um, which chances are you're not because 90, literally 99.6 of the viewers on this channel are not subscribed. So follow along. Um, come, come learn as I do. And of course, if you see us at a race or go into anything in the Northwest or anything like that, come, come hit me up and come chat it up. We're all in this uh, off-road world together. So jump on board. Anyway, Peace out, guys. Thanks.